Thank you, Dr. Berg, for the introduction. I'm truly amazed that uh, in this pandemic, you are pulling off such a, an amazing conference. I'm really excited today about this presentation because I have a little bit of a contrarian view about how to use fat in a low carb diet. And I'm asking the question, can fat be potentially harmful for us especially in people who are obese and insulin resistant. And I want to explore what lipotoxicity is. So this is a typical patient that one would see who is trying to lose weight. There is abdominal and visceral obesity, high insulin levels, just a slight increase in their sugar levels. But there is an increase in the fat in the blood, which is known as triglycerides. And the low carb community is telling these people that by all means have bulletproof coffee, fatty meat, large amounts of olive oil and butter in your diet. And is that right? That is the paradigm that I want to see. Can it harm? And in order to get to this journey, I'm going to describe what the pancreas is. We're going to explore the hormone insulin and glucagon and how they work with each other. I also want to put out a concept that diabetes is a bihormonal disorder. It's not just as a result of insulin, insulin alone, but there is an interaction between insulin and glucagon. That is the work of one of my heroes, a fellow Texan that I'm going to point, point out. I also want to understand what insulin is and what insulin resistance and insulin receptor are. We will be getting into lipotoxicity or fat toxicity and specifically looking at a type of fat called ceramide that Ben Bickman has recently talked about that is important in fat toxicity. Insulin and the, the endocrine part of the pancreas where insulin is made was discovered uh, by Paul Langerhans. This was in 1860s and I'm amazed that even though the islets in the pancreas actually make up only about 2% of the pancreas, 98% of the pancreas is what is called the exocrine, exocrine pancreas, and that's making the digestive juices. The endocrine pancreas with the insulin producing cells here, the glucagon producing cells in dark blue, is only 2% of the pancreas. If you were to put it into a teaspoon, the total amount of insulin making machinery in us is a quarter of a teaspoon, about 1.5 grams, 1500 milligrams. Isn't that amazing that something so tiny can yet be so powerful? This is an image of the pancreas. And in here you see the insulin producing cells in red and the glucagon producing cells in green. They are juxtaposed to each other. They are right next to each other. I want to explore with you, is this juxtaposition an accident of nature or does it have a specific functional significance? Insulin is made out to be a bad player. But is it truly bad? Does it do some important functions in our body? And yes, it does. One of the functions of insulin is to take the carbs that we have eaten and activate a channel. So as insulin sits on the insulin receptor, it activates a channel called GLUT4 and that takes in sugar inside the cell. If it's inside the liver cell, you convert it into a storage form of sugar called glycogen. In the muscles, it can potentially be burned through the mitochondria 
to generate energy for the muscles. The action of insulin on the insulin receptor also creates signaling inside the cell that makes us build new protein. Our lean muscle mass depends on the action of insulin. This is perhaps a very important accept of, accept, uh, aspect of insulin that we perhaps are not looking into well enough. And that is its role in depositing fat that we have eaten into the fat cells. Fat that you have eaten into the fat cell gets packed into a lipoprotein called chylomicron. And you want to reduce the amount of fat that is circulating in the bloodstream for a long time, and that is the action of insulin, to take this fat and by activating a certain enzyme, pack it into the fat cells. In fact, the ability of insulin to pack the fat into the fat cells is an important sign of health. In addition, the fat can also be burned for energy in the muscles and in the heart. Our brain is rich in insulin receptors. When insulin sits on the insulin receptors, it activates a series of chemical reactions that makes the brain make new protein. And this protein increases synaptic plasticity. What that means is that it improves the connection between the brain cells. The functioning of our brain is improved by proper action of insulin and insulin receptor, in other words, insulin signaling. To summarize, insulin is released with food intake. As Americans, we consume a large amount of carbs, <clears throat> and the carbs needs to be packed into the liver as glycogen, into the muscles as glycogen. We need to make new protein from the amino acids. We need to pack the fat that we have eaten into the fat cells. We need to improve our brain function in terms of synaptic plasticity. And that's the role of insulin. What then is the role of glucagon? We are not designed to eat all the time. And when we are not eating, our brain needs a constant supply of glucose. That is the job of glucagon. What glucagon does is that when you have not eaten, it makes the liver make glucose for the brain. And for that, it can either take the glycerol from the release of fat into the bloodstream, convert the glycerol into glucose. It can break down protein and take the amino acids in a, through a process called gluconeogenesis will then make glucose through the liver. It can also take fatty acids from the fat cells and convert them to ketones. So when you look at insulin and glucagon, insulin is there to use and store sugar as glycogen to build new protein, to pack the fat into the fat cell so that the fat is not left in the bloodstream. So it's an anabolic hormone. Glucagon is a catabolic hormone. It makes sugar when the brain needs it by breaking down glycogen by using glycerol from the fat cells, by using amino acids from muscle breakdown. So it breaks down protein to make sugar when necessary. It also takes the fat that is released in the fat through the lipolysis and in the liver can convert it into ketones. As Americans, we have been eating a large amount of refined carbs and the more carbs you eat and the more frequently you eat, you make insulin. And we throw our terms like insulin resistance. And I must tell you that I did not understand insulin resistance well. 
So what then is insulin resistance? So I've shown this diagram many times and I must say that I followed this paradigm of insulin resistance in which the cell is stuffed with glucose. There's a lot of glucose in the bloodstream and the insulin is produced in excess to drive more and more glucose inside the cell. And I'd like to submit that I was wrong. In fact, I showed this picture of the Japanese train during rush hour. The Japanese train is full during rush hour. And there is Japanese police that is designed to take the passengers from the platform and pack them into the train so that they can clear the platform. That was the paradigm of insulin resistance that I have used in my presentation. But the real paradigm is that the reason we have insulin resistance is because of malfunctioning and down regulation of the insulin receptor. The cell is sugar starved, glucose starved. It cannot get into the cell despite there being a large amount of sugar in the bloodstream because the insulin receptor is not working. The proper analogy of insulin resistance is a cart and a horse. Years of refined carb ingestion, large amount, persistent and frequent, increases the amount of insulin leading to hyperinsulinemia that down regulates the insulin receptor leading to insulin resistance. How does that happen? This is the schematic that we were working with. Insulin is activating GLUT4, activating certain intracellular signals to make new protein. In the presence of persistent and repeated insulin increase, the intracellular signaling is gone for taking in glucose for making new protein. As this continues, the insulin receptor goes and hides inside. This is called receptor endocytosis. And if this persists, not only does the insulin receptor hide, but it is taken up by the garbage disposal mechanism called the lysosome out here, and the insulin receptor is actually destroyed. The effects on brain of insulin resistance are devastating because the insulin receptor is in hiding. Lack of insulin signaling will reduce the plasticity, the new protein that is providing connections between the brain. But in addition, the beta amyloid, which is a toxic protein, is elaborated in large amounts that kills our brain cells, giving rise to Alzheimer's. In fact, Type 3 diabetes, dementia is considered as type 3 diabetes. So to be redundant, the actions of insulin is that insulin signaling takes in sugar into the cells through GLUT4, takes amino acids and builds new protein. It's very important to clear fat from the circulation and pack it into the fat cells. It's important for our brain function through insulin receptors on the brain for synaptic plasticity. Insulin is crucially important in cholesterol metabolism, a fact that we will get into in another talk. And this is a nice segue to explain that there is parachronology between insulin and glucagon. What does that mean? Let me explore that with you. The low carb community has benefited a lot from Dr. Joseph Kraft. He described the insulin response to an ingestion of a glucose load. But we also owe a depth of gratitude to somebody else, my hero, who has shown us a lot of important things that the low carb community can learn from, and that is Dr. Roger Unger. He's described 
the parachronology, the juxtaposition between insulin and glucagon. Here is a normal pancreas, insulin producing cells in red, glucagon in green. Hyperinsulinemia, an early part of type 2 diabetes, is a hypertrophy of the beta cells. The beta cells are larger, more in number, and consequently they are making more insulin. Why is that happening? And how does that relate to insulin resistance we have already gone into because it's persistent and repeated carbohydrate ingestion. However, it's also important to know that this beta cell that is making insulin, insulin is made through the manufacturing machinery inside the cell as insulin granules. There are different types of granules inside the cells. Some of these granules are more mature and they are docked at the cell membrane and they are called the rapid release pool. I want to tell you why that is important. Before I get into that, I'd like to explain that insulin is released by the beta cells in a pulsatile fashion. So this is a person who's fasting. Insulin is going up and down. It's in a cyclical pattern. All hormones are released in a cyclical pattern. And the reason it is important is because it helps with receptor function. If a hormone is released continuously, it'll downregulate its receptor. The receptors will not function as well. So here is describing you how insulin is stored. It's stored in a granule pool. Some of these granules are more mature and they are called the readily releasable pool. Whereas there is a reserve pool of granules that are not ready for release. Why is that important? The reason it's important is because the readily releasable pool is responsible for phase one insulin release. When you eat carbs, it goes and tells a signal to the pancreatic beta cells to release insulin. And the initial release is very rapid. It's a burst which is the phase one response. Now this constitutes only about five to 10% of total insulin that is released in response to a meal. The remainder of it is a little bit slower mobilization, but it's a larger amount. In order to have the readily releasable pool happen effectively, one has to eat less frequently for the insulin making machinery to recover, to regenerate, to repopulate this pool so that phase one spike can happen. This phase one spike is the first to go in people who become hyperinsulinemic, who become insulin resistant. To paraphrase Dr. Unger, insulin begins its journey in the beta cells and the first cell that it exposes a high concentration of insulin to is the alpha cells. There is a juxtaposition which is not an accident of nature, it's a design. Insulin consequently is present in much higher concentrations, 4,000 micro units per ml, and the role is to suppress the production of glucagon. By the time it comes to the liver through circulation between the pancreas and the liver, which is called the Splanchnik circulation, there is a significant dilution, 600 micro units. And the role for this is that the liver sees the ingestion of large amounts of carbs by us and gets ready to say that this American has eaten a large amount of refined carbs, I better get ready to pack it. 
By the time it gets into the peripheral circulation, it's about a 40-fold further dilution. But notice this is without glucagon and that helps pack the fat into the fat cells and helps use fat for energy and sugar for energy. In a type 1 diabetic, injection of insulin can never have the paracrine effect between insulin and glucagon. And that's one reason why you need to protect the insulin making machinery. A paracrine effect is effect in the adjacent area from where the hormone is released. An endocrine effect is an effect of a hormone way distant from where it is released, like it's released in the pancreas, but it's acting on the fat cells, it's acting on the muscles, it's acting in the brain. This is showing you the paracrine effect. This is the phase one insulin response in response to a slight increase in sugar. And this phase one response is very crucial so that it drops the glucagon levels. This reduction in glucagon permits the liver to suck up the carbs that we have eaten. That is the paracrine effect that Dr. Unger described. One of the first things that is lost with hyperinsulinemia, with repeated ingestion of carbs, with more frequent ingestion of carbs, is that you do not mount the phase one response anymore. This is a normal phase one response followed by slower release of insulin. Phase one response is gone in hyperinsulinemia and insulin resistant, even though more insulin is produced. And the reason is because there is depletion of the granules that are present to be released in response to the initial increase in sugar. So when this parachronology is lost, the rapid release is absent. The glucagon is no longer suppressed. It continues to increase and you cannot control the sugar. Now this experiment demonstrates that how cyclical administration of insulin is important even in a type 1 diabetic. So here is a type 1 diabetic being given saline. The glucose levels are high. There is no insulin because they're not making any insulin. And at a certain point, a 5 gram dose of arginine, which is an amino acid that elicits an insulin response and a glucagon response is given. So as arginine is given, glucagon goes up and as glucagon goes up, the liver makes a lot more sugar and sugar levels go up. In this panel, this is sugar. Insulin is being given in a continuous fashion, not in a pulsatile fashion at a certain amount. When the arginine is given, despite insulin being present, the glucagon release is not suppressed. There's a similar increase in sugar levels. On the other hand, when insulin is injected in a pulsatile fashion, a certain amount every two minutes, and then not given for 11 minutes, what happens is that the increase in sugar in response to the arginine pulse is much less, lower. And the reason that is the case is because pulsatile insulin suppresses glucagon. And that is shown more elegantly here. That glucagon response to this arginine with continuous insulin is not suppressed, but it is suppressed with pulsatile insulin. And the same numbers are shown below in the diagram. So I want to be redundant. What is the action of insulin on glucagon and on the liver is that after ingestion of a meal, insulin is present to suppress glucagon. It acts on the liver and converts the eaten carbs into a storage form of glycogen and it reduces the output of sugar by the liver. 
It also helps pack fat into the fat cells because the amount of glucagon that is released into the peripheral circulation is much lower. In the setting of insulin resistance, the alpha cells are covered by fat. There is a specific type of toxic fat called ceramide that Ben Bickman has done some research on that I'll elaborate a little later in my talk. When the alpha cell is covered with fat, it does not see insulin. And when it doesn't see insulin, it continues to release glucagon. In the presence of glucagon, there is hepatic insulin resistance. The liver is no longer able to pack the carbs that you have eaten. Instead of just not packing the carbs, it increases the amount of sugar it is putting out. It elaborates inflammatory mediators. It makes a lot more fat, as I will describe. Because of peripheral insulin resistance, now the fat cells are inflamed. They cannot take in fat, and the muscles cannot burn fat either. And that is because of the abnormal parachronology that I described. The spike in insulin is absolutely essential to suppress glucagon. When the spike in insulin is gone after a carbohydrate meal and the setting of insulin resistance, because the beta cells are depleted from continuous and repeated stimulation, the spike is gone. Even though insulin is at a higher level, it fails to suppress glucagon. The sugar levels are high and the fat cannot be packed. So high glucagon levels happen in that setting. High glucagon in the setting of insulin resistance is detrimental for us. The reason is that it is making us lose lean muscle because the body, when it is not needed, is breaking down muscle and using the amino acids to increase sugar output. It takes in fat from the fat cells, but it cannot burn the fat as I have described in another talk. Instead of being able to burn the fat, it recycles the fat out because the fat output in insulin resistance by the liver goes up. As this fat output goes up, this fat cannot be repacked. It remains in the circulation. And when it remains longer in the circulation, it gets into our heart, into our liver, and into our pancreas that, as shown here and creates a fatty pancreas which is detrimental to our health. So an obese individual on a high fat diet is hyperinsulinemic. The liver is putting out more sugar. There is high triglycerides. And can this person actually eat fat and not suffer from fat toxicity? One of the myths that I want to dispel is that protein also elicits an insulin response. I showed that earlier in my slide with arginine. So here is a study in which a person is taking glucose, the insulin has gone up 50 grams. When they're taking protein, the insulin also goes up, maybe a little less and a, a more delayed peak, but the amount is the same. Of course, when you give protein and glucose together, the rise in insulin is a lot more. So it's important to find out before we eat fat whether we have healthy fat tissue. Healthy adipose tissue is capable of packing fat into it. So in other words, when there is fat in the bloodstream, it can take in fat. It releases only the amount of fatty acids that are necessary. It has a high level of a hormone called adiponectin which tells us that the fat cells are healthy. They're not inflamed. And the fat that is released can be taken up by the liver, converted to ketones, can be taken up by the muscles and the heart and burned for energy. So what I want to tell you is that a high fat diet is something that may be detrimental if you can't pack it into the fat cells or burn it away that fat left in the bloodstream will cause visceral obesity. 
and later I'm going to describe that fat can be converted to a toxic fat product called ceramide. So this is unhealthy adipose tissue. This is fat cells that are inflamed. They are overstuffed. They cannot pack in fat that is in the bloodstream. They are insulin resistance, resistant. They have low adiponectin levels and they are unable to contain the fat in them so a lot of large amount of fat is released. This fat that is released cannot be burned for oxidation. So it gets deposited as ectopic fat because of insulin resistance in the liver, in the muscles, in the heart and in the pancreas leading to pancreatic failure. This is an elegant study that describes fat deposition in the pancreas in mice by Dr. Unger. So these are DBDB mice and this is the regular normal lean mice and you can see that their sugar level, sorry, the sugar levels are normal as is the level of fat in their pancreas. The DBDB mice that are shown in red, for the first eight weeks of life, the sugar levels are normal. The pancreatic fat is just slightly higher, but as the pancreatic fat is going up, the sugar levels are climbing at about eight weeks. So they become diabetic at eight weeks. Why is this happening? What Dr. Unger has demonstrated is that the lean mice, this is their mitochondria, this is their insulin making machinery that has made insulin granules. The mitochondria are normal. On the other hand, the DBDB mice at about eight weeks, the fat is getting infiltrated into the pancreas, into the mitochondria. The mitochondria are almost not recognizable and the insulin granules are far fewer in number. So this is lipotoxicity of the pancreas. This has also been shown by Lydia Shashipank and she showed that in humans in whom she measured the pancreatic fat content with imaging techniques, normal people had low pancreatic fat. As they became obese, the pancreatic fat content increased. As they became insulin resistant in which insulin was not working well, the pancreatic fat content increased even further and it was highest in type 2 diabetics in which the fat content was now destroying the better cells. So I want to introduce ceramides. What are ceramides? Ceramides are derived from fat and protein metabolism. They have certain functions in the body and their production and removal is tightly controlled. However, in the setting of insulin resistance, there is an overproduction of ceramide that is destructive to many cells in our body. So I want to show you what ceramides really are in the most simplistic terms possible. The fat cells that are inflamed are releasing a lot of fatty acids into the circulation that cannot be oxidized. There's a breakdown product of protein called serine. And in the presence of an enzyme SPT, these two are combined together to make ceramide. When large amounts of ceramide is present, it gets into the liver, the muscles, and the heart, and it makes insulin not work well. But when it gets into the pancreas, it's especially destructive. Out here was supposed to be a picture of pancreas that got lost. And when it gets into the pancreas, it destroys the nucleus of the pancreas. This is the nucleus that's supposed to look much nicer, but it has been destroyed. If you're used to looking at this, you would understand. And that's as a result of ceramide toxicity. So ceramide gets into our cells when there is a lot of fatty acids. These fatty acids elicit an immunologic response. It, the, our body cannot recognize them as our own. It creates a certain signaling that activates ceramide-making enzymes 
and the cell takes the fatty acids and the serine, makes ceramide, it destroys our mitochondria, it destroys our protein making machinery. It makes mediators that block signaling of insulin. In other words, when insulin signaling is blocked, you cannot pack fat into the fat cells, you cannot make glycogen, you cannot make new protein. And it also creates certain factors that are called inflammation enablers that tell our cells to make more inflammatory mediators like interleukin B. So to hammer it home, ceramide is lipotoxic. It reduces insulin signaling in the brain, in the muscles, in the fat tissue. It destroys the insulin making machinery in the pancreas. It damages the eye. It damages the liver. And it also causes insulin resistance at the level of the heart. So I'm getting towards the end of my point. Should an obese individual be on a high fat diet when they are hyperinsulinemic, when they have high glucagon levels, when they have mild glucose intolerance, when they have high amounts of fat circulating in their bloodstream, when they have low adiponectin levels and high inflammation markers? Should they be taking in bulletproof coffee, MCT, olive oil, fatty meat, what I'd like to submit to you is that these individuals need to empty their fat cells. They need to work on ways to improve their satiety so that they eat less food, to reduce inflammation in their fat cells, to improve their cholesterol quality, to make insulin signaling better. How can they do that? The way they can do that is by reducing meal frequency. Intermittent fasting is a good method. Under supervision of my organization, and that's my disclosure, I work now with IDM and with the fasting method, long-term fasting may be beneficial in these individuals for them to become fat burning and empty their fat cells. There are satiety control techniques that they can use. And I have just put out a YouTube video on the potential for caffeine and exercise together to augment fat burning. So Dr. Berg, thank you for having me on your symposium. And I hope that this was useful.